that's that's the way I feel about lately. Uh, I know that he was very very sick. I, when I saw him, I said to myself, "Oh God, how can he possibly still enjoy himself?" Uh, I'm regretful at this. It's a second floor of the synagogue. I don't know if I'm going to go to the synagogue. I'm going to go to the synagogue. I'm going to go to the synagogue. I David lived a full life. Uh, I think we should celebrate his life. Uh, Say, yeah. he lived a full life, and even full lives have to have an end. Maybe, why? Thank you. Uh, we have our third uh, speaker in uh, Lima. Uh, that would be Professor Felipe Miranda.
and addressing us with the PSA countries. That was most fortunate for us. I like to think that it was also fortunate for him. But it was also a sad experience because during the open forum after the keynote, I asked him whether he thought he might have a quick sequel to Filipino politics, development, and decay. After all, this was written in 1988. And so, there was enough time to reflect on politics in this country if he had thought that he could go further. And if you spoke of development and decay, then addressing the cyclic nature of history, you would think that after decay, there would be development again. It might be a dialectical kind of development, a superior kind of development, but there would be development. Many of you were in the PPSA countries. Do you remember how he how he replied to my probe? Well, in characteristic Warfellian language, he partially avoided the issue. But to those who were not going to be misled, by that which is a superficial answer, he actually provided us with a fruitful, a fruitful plan. He said, I'm going to leave to the younger scholars the task of fashioning another reading of Philippine politics. And he thought that like the warfare he was, David, the optimist, from my point of view, par excellence. He was thinking that why he may not live to see the day when there shall be development once more in this country, he trusted that the young enough people, Joel, this is the reason why there are young people, They'll get to see the Philippines. But we, I hope you, but uh, for the meantime, let me inflict my numerology in both of us that we may not get to this. Uh, <clears throat> a great human being, a freedom love, of course. But then, he also was, I think, one of the best public intellectuals that ever graced this country. And what is great is that he was not even born Filipino, but he cared about the Philippines so much that when he wrote about us, he was not simply writing as a Filipino. He was writing as someone truly concerned about the welfare, the modernization, and the democratization of this country. We had a few scholars in our midst, foreign scholars, who, like David, are similarly concerned. A public intellectual is, by definition, an activist. He may not run the streets, but in his writings, in his public utterances, in his interactions with those who are in power as, as well as those who are not in power, he would reveal himself truthfully, completely truthfully. As a political intellectual, I think he was able to accept influence on quite a few facts. If you look at the collage of photographs behind me, there is one set of David here 
that might remind you of the first director of the Telwood Study Center. Huh? That side your baby looks much like Randy David. <laughs> Another public interest. Of course, you would not like to overemphasize this. This guy normally would not belong to Atadin. This guy would belong to Hadi. But uh, in David, you find the kind of sensitiveness that would melt academic interest and at the same time public commitment. Such people transcend national boundaries. And so I'm not surprised that they learn to love this country and to be concerned about this country perhaps quite a bit more than most of our people whether in Atati or Bia. In his academic career, there was something that kept him focused on the field. Many competent, even at times iconic scholars, are bound to their, fo to their academic focuses, to their subjects of interest, mainly by the availability of funds. Something interesting happened in the scholarship of Southeast Asia between 1965 and 1985. In the China got to be the main interest. Vietnam certainly the most focused interest. The Philippines was no longer interesting. And so many of your Filipinologists, as I said, some of them even economic, decided that uh, it was prudent to shift their academic focuses, their researches, where the fund was available. They studied Vietnam. They also studied Indonesia. But they left the Philippines. In 1986, late 86, David was here on campus and uh, we had very few personal dealings. I have not been as fortunate as to go for Joe, perhaps even uh, here. Uh, our interactions were largely professional. The personal, I can see how I missed so much in there. So he passed by the house and he said, you know, I have just been invited to a, uh, to a conference by a group that I know must be a CIA from you. So why do you think I might be invited? I said, let me offer a guess. I think it's because you are one of the few remaining Filipinologists. And between you and the others who are much more, much more radically inclined and have publicly expressed themselves as such, I think the CIA thought that you are a little bit more safe to begin with. Perhaps that's the reason why you are in that conference. Not the funds, but the group public intellectuals interest. That was what kept him focused on the Philippines. Even as so many of our Filipinologists, for it, rushed back to the Philippines in 1986 to catch up on Philippine studies. Because again, there was interest, and with interest came funding. The Intelligence and Research Division of the Department of State was actually looking for scholars, preferably liberal, at best. But then if they could not find enough, 
they may not even be able to locate two or three to bring them to the kind of discussions that uh, often take place at the INR, then they would have people like they come in. Well, in uh, David Warfel's uh, professional life, and I dare say, listening to to uh, the dog, also having heard from Randy and to Joel uh, in his personal life too, in all probability. There was development, sustained development in David all the way up to his 81st year of life. You'll be frustrated if you look for the game. I don't think there was ever a game in this person's life. So, what did this academic really manage to do? Which other people, brilliant academics also, did not manage? I think, um, I think he pursued his political studies as if it were indeed an obsession and an, an obsession with science. Science thrives on truthfulness, not politeness. The word polite and the word political come from the same root. And yet, if you are going to study politically, any particular country, I think there is a world of difference between being simply polite and being a political scientist. This phenomenon was already adumbrated on by Gunnar Hilda in 1965 in his classic Asian drama which focused on poverty and disparity where he excoriated academics for cottoning up to uh, the administrators, the politicians, the powerful and self-censoring themselves and engaging in polite analysis of societies that would do well, would do better, if they had been able to do David did not suffer from this particular academic sin, I would dare say mortal sin, and yet he was a fully civilized person. I don't think there was ever a more gracious person than David. I saw him several times opening opening doors to gun people as long as they belong to the right gender. I never saw him open a door to a, to a boy or a, to a woman, I'm uh, sorry, man, but the young girls, women, this age, and older. They would open doors for them. Now, as regards the last point, this really did not belong to my narrative. But this is such a beautiful thing to learn from the law that uh, Herbert Field, you know, was a guy who would not let anything go to waste. And therefore, you must watch out for the vegetables that he grew in his organic garden. I suppose they did probably partook of the vegetables that Herbert Fee grew in his garden. And the reason why I'm ending on this particular note is because it is something I can personally identify with. If you are in my place and there are vegetables too, I think you should watch out because I do not allow even 
organic resources to go to waste. If you will not allow urine and urea to go to waste, there is no reason why something which is even more organic, a human being, and particularly a young human being, a student, must be allowed to lie fallow for the rest. I think David understood this, but beyond understanding it, I think he did. And so many of his students, therefore, find in David something absolutely unforgettable. Thank you so much. Certainly, uh, very few scholars will be able to fill in the shoes left uh, behind by uh, David. At this point, I call on Professor Jose Cueva to say a few words to Thank you. Just a very few words, really. The reason is that our uh, speakers have already uh, told us uh, so much, it's so meaningful and so descriptive of David uh, Warfare. I just want to say uh, at the outset how, how shocked I was to hear the news that uh, David had passed away because our last uh, encounter was just through the telephone. Uh, he had come back from the political science convention in I didn't know that he was here. But he called me, he was uh, staying at Balakarina. And uh, I had a very strong, strong urge to, to see him. But regretfully, I really had a series of appointments. So it turned out to be our, our last uh, conversation. But it shows you how, how deeply friendly and gracious David was that on his last day or the day before he left the Philippines, he thought that really calling me. I just want to say that the theme of uh, David's interest in the Philippines, which is reflected in the title of his book, Development and Decay, is also uh, the theme of my, of my focus on our own country's uh, political development and decay. On, the person, on a personal note, uh, of course, not being the youngest, I mean, I had the, probably the oldest uh, connection with David. <coughs> and uh, among the high points of uh, our relationship was really his, his, his uh, being turned off by America's involvement in the Vietnam War which uh, made him change his, his citizenship. And shortly after that, uh, I happened to, be, to visit him in Windsor. He, he went across the Lake Michigan, uh, lived in Windsor and taught in a university there. So I was his guest and uh, this uh, very warm, very warm person uh, as my boss and uh, an equally warm uh, wife came in. And uh, because I think we have our connection happens also to be related to University of Michigan. Uh, that, that added uh, something to our, to our friendship. And then my son also studied in University of Michigan. I went on vacation in Windsor in David's, uh, in David's home. We were always so hospitable to my uh, son as well. So, um, I'm going to 
I'm so glad those who spoke uh, before me uh, uh, said so much that it's meaningful and, and really uh, descriptive of, of David. A truly warm human being who really came uh, for our country and for Filipinos, Filipino scholars, and who was very appreciative of what we wrote. the same subject. So I would like to know the email of Kathy because I would very much like to, to write her or call her out. If I could also have a telephone number. So I, I join all of you in expressing our uh, sympathies to his family. And like those of you who spoke and others, I did have a very personal uh, and, and scholarly relationship with David, from which I most uh, benefited. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, are there any more uh, in the audience who would like to uh, give their reflections, give their thoughts? outside uh, the convention that part 